Welcome to Darren Batchelder's Real Estate Investing Show. Each week, you will learn how to grow your wealth through real estate investing, be introduced to the players that are getting it done, and learn how you can get involved. And now, here's your host, Darren Batchelder. Hello, everyone. Today, we've got a special guest here with us today. We've got Lo Hornbuckle. Lo, I appreciate you coming on. Yeah, thank you so much for having me, Darren. Absolutely. So how I know Lo is uh, my business partner on my first syndication deal, Raj Gupta. Um, after we closed that deal, which was uh, the end of, uh, it was December 2018, um, he came back to me like a month or two later and said, "Hey, Darren, man, you should really reach out to Lo. He's, I'm, you know, I don't know where they met, but he said he's just a good guy. I, I need to get to know him." And so I reached out to to Lo. We had a conversation. I don't know if you even remember this. It's going back a few years, but um, you know, I I was trying to get a feel for what space he was in, and and he was in the senior living space, and I was really trying to stay focused on on the multifamily space. So there wasn't a fit for us to work together uh, right then and there, but I think that it's, you know, great timing to bring somebody on. He's the first person I'm bringing on to the show that has anything to do with senior living. So I'm really interested to hear what he has to say and, um, you know, where he sees the market going in the future. So, uh, with that Lo, if you wouldn't mind sharing how many properties and how many units you're currently invested in. Yeah, for sure. Well, uh, I do remember the conversation and uh, Raj is a good guy. So, I mean, we both got to be pretty good guys if we're connected to him, right? Right. But exactly. um, Yeah. So, uh, you know, thanks for having me on the show. And I kind of joke a little bit that if you think about it, senior living is 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 the multifamily, right? Because not only are you dealing with a resident, but you're actually are, are also dealing with their families and their expectations. But um, right now we've got about 40 beds in Dallas with about about 200 beds under construction um, is our is our primary focus. We also do some some build to rent um, uh, single family development, but our, our focus of the show today obviously is on the assisted living and memory care piece. So we've got about you know 35 million under construction at present. That's that's awesome. So high level, you know, for people that don't really understand the the senior living space, kind of give us a 30,000 foot view level on on that you know that space. Yeah, thank you. I, I like to do that anyway, um, just because the word senior housing, you know, it kind of has a it kind of has a meaning. So, like, if you're reading the Wall Street Journal, for example, and they're writing about senior housing, you know, in quotes, um, they're really talking about multiple different types of, of housing for uh, people that are age restricted, and in some cases, not even age restricted. It's just a, you know dealing with your care needs or cognitive impairment. So. Think about it as in a, in this business, there's kind of a, a struggle. There's a spectrum of healthcare and hospitality. So, on the very far end of the hospitality side, you have independent living, active adult. These are age restricted communities that are often you know built around golf courses or tennis clubs or some other sort of amenity where people who are like minded and and have a similar interests gather together you know most people in independent living might still be driving for example Um, and they're older than you might think even though generally they're 55 or 62 is the cutoff but a lot of them are 70s 80s that type of thing and then you kind of move into uh, assisted living memory care which are usually kind of considered part of the same class and those are people that need assistance with their activities of daily living so that's things like you know going to the restroom taking medication um, proper nutrition exercise, uh, things that you need to get through the day. Um, and uh, they, uh, so that's kind of now starting to move into the healthcare side of the model. And then all the way on the other end of the spectrum, you have uh, skilled nursing, could be long-term or short-term. And those are, uh, you know, housing units where there is a, a full medical overlay, a nursing component, and often a, a physician component overlaid, and their needs are generally a little bit greater. Over the years, the line between independent living and assisted living, assisted living and memory care, all the way into skilled nursing has gotten very blurry. Um, however, the thing to understand is just on one end, you have the, kind of the hospitality side. On the other end of the side, you kind of have the healthcare side. And we're kind of in the middle where we have both a blend of hospitality and a blend uh, of healthcare. Um, I don't like to think about them as one asset class because actually they're really upstream, downstream providers to each other. And so 
the issue for us is is that you know you can sometimes see independent living having occupancy go in one direction and you could have you know assisted living or memory care and skilled nursing going in another um, so they aren't necessarily part of one asset class necessarily because they do move independently of each other uh, like the average age in assisted living for example is around 87 um, and so obviously uh, when we talk about things like the baby boomers I, I usually try to go through the whole show without mentioning the baby boomers so I apologize <laughs> I'm actually going to make fun of the baby boomers as it relates to assisted living right now so the oldest baby boomer is 74 75 so the vast majority of those people are not yet interacting with the assisted living memory care part of the product but they are interacting with the independent living side of things so that's the you know margaritavilles of the world the you know large uh, massive properties and sometimes smaller where people are moving into age restricted communities so one of the reasons why i'm so bullish on the industry long term is the big demographic stuff really doesn't hit for 10 or 15 years um, in our okay. business explain explain that sure yeah so obviously you know you can't really for the last 30 years it seems like everyone's been talking about this wave of baby boomers and it's been called the right. silver tsunami and it's been called all those things but but fundamentally again if the oldest person in that in that demographic wave is 74 75 our average age is 87 then on average they really aren't interacting with the product so the baby boomers just refers to a generation of people uh born from 1946 to 1964 yeah, you know, obviously it's termed from when uh, soldiers came home from World War II and they did what soldiers do when they come home from war and they started making babies. And so that's the baby boom. Um, strangely, the millennial group is actually larger in terms of sheer numbers, but in terms of economic impact, the baby boomers are pretty much undeniable. If you kind of go back and look at the last 60 or 70 years of America, if you just got in a business that happened to serve the baby boomer demographic, you probably did very well. Right. Um, and so a lot of people that talk about assisted living or, or skilled nursing or memory care uh, are often talking about this silver tsunami that's coming, these baby boomers that are coming. They're right, but they're wrong in so much as it's not really here yet. Um, and so it's really something that's kind of coming down the pipeline. Depending so on what segment long -term. you're in. Go ahead, take it. Depending on what segment of, of, of exactly you're if you're in independent living and you're talking about the senior housing umbrella if you're talking about active adult there there are you know there are absolutely you know resorts that are like hey we play grateful dead music in the rolling stones come live with us you know it's that kind of mentality as opposed to a lot of care needs now saying all that in in my communities in dallas at one time i had as someone as young as 33 and as old as 107 living with me so it's not as though baby boomers are not involved in assisted living or memory care it's just they're not involved at such a level that it's really a demographic trend per se it's more of an, a one-off or an outlier more so than, than the whole group of people right that, that makes sense so um it's very interesting to me because uh, i i read and and see like a lot of places going up and it just makes sense to me as the population continues to age that it's going to be a bigger and bigger um you know asset class to take a look at and and it's also a very wealthy demographic, you know, so, yeah. you know, the baby boomers have a lot of money. And so they want, you know, into their aging lives, they're going to want to spend that money on quality care as they as they age. So um, I'm interested in that. So one of the things, uh, you know, I wanted to understand was the difference between multifamily like good markets you know between sure. multifamily and senior living like with multifamily we think of you know we want to be in markets that are landlord friendly that have population growth and income growth you know those are like the major factors is it the same in in your asset class or is it more about the aging well um a lot of it's the same so a lot of the areas that are targeted you know, the Floridas of the world, the Texas of the world are also very hot for assisted living, memory care and other forms of senior housing as well. Um, but a lot of that's more related to weather um, than anything, just because obviously as people age, they usually like to be in a little bit warmer climates. Right. There's absolutely a connection between uh, population. And low taxes and, isn't bad either. Sure. Right. Yeah. There's obviously, a, um, you know, a, a migration that happens. So, for example, if um, 
son or daughter is the primary caretaker for, for mom or dad who's recently widowed, they relocate for a job, then there is sometimes a following effect that happens where mom moves nearby, maybe lives with them for a couple of years, and then they might you know transition to assisted living or memory care facility. So jobs and population growth are certainly connected, but really more so you're looking for supply demand imbalances because you can have a successful senior housing market where the job situation isn't very good. Um, you know, you could have a market where, uh, you know, say 20 or 30 years ago, a lot of wealth was created in that market. And then now the population's on decline. And usually the people that hang on are the people that no longer need those jobs, right? So if a, a, a town is very much based around a you know factory or plant, plant closes, usually the older folks don't necessarily, you know, move away because uh, they're not chasing that anymore. They're living off fixed income. They're living off savings or other investments that they made. So they're not necessarily, necessarily interconnected. So you're looking for those kind of supply, demand imbalances. Right. Our company really does focus on uh, secondary and tertiary markets. And I'll explain why in a second. But the, 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 the idea for me really is senior housing in, and I'm now I'm using the term as a catch all is right. very much overbuilt in quite a few markets. And part of the reason why is a lot of people have bought into this baby boomer story. And the truth is, is that, you know, if you build something and your customers are coming in 15 years or maybe five years ago, they're coming in 20 years, then, then you really, you're really not focused on that demographic wave. So I think there was a lot of people that got caught up in the, demand, 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 demand side of things and really didn't study the supply side. So you have some markets that, you know, are overbuilt and that have those challenges and I'm, I'm bullish on them long term, but you got to get to that, that, that first edge of the wave in order to sort of meet that. We're so in a put, little bit. Put of you a, on the spot. What, sure. what, what, would, what would be some of those markets that you think are so Dallas is always in the top five, which is where I chose to start my operation. So I kind of like that because I feel like if I've been successful in Dallas, which is a very challenging, difficult market, we usually outperform the market, then that's kind of a market. You know, I think San Antonio's is one. Um, I really study the Texas markets mostly, so I don't really look at a lot of overbuilt numbers nationally. Now, when you're but, saying bringing these markets up, Dallas, San Antonio, are you saying that those are attractive markets or those are markets that are oversaturated? So they generally always find their way on the overbuilt list. Gotcha. Now, what our company tries to do, so the reason we focus on secondary and tertiary markets, we find it's very difficult for a secondary and tertiary market to be overbuilt, right? No one's in a boardroom in New York trying to solve a senior housing problem in a, a ring city of Dallas, which is a nice perk. Land is less expensive. We develop mostly, and so that's kind of an attractive feature. And honestly, because, um, because the rents sometimes are not necessarily related to um, the same metrics you would find. You can often find similar rents in a suburban market as you would an urban market, right? So there's opportunity there for, for, uh, for good, uh, good potential. Um, one of the things that I really want to clarify that really makes this different from multifamily for your listeners is this is a people-driven business. So when I do apartment shows, just imagine for a moment that you've got a leasing agent with a client and you're showing them apartments and the apartment's the wrong location it's maybe a little out of their price range, but they love the leasing agent. How many times are they going to lease that place? Most people would say not very much in multifamily, but in assisted living, if you resonate with a person, with a team, with a caregiver, the executive director, you will often make decisions where it's not the perfect location, not the perfect price. Maybe the room's not exactly the room that you want because you're really in the people business. Right. And so it's very different, whereas multifamily is more location, price, competitive based. It's more of a commoditized business. Assisted living is much more of a service business. And so what you really have to do is if you're going to go into competitive markets, you absolutely have to have a compelling, unique selling proposition um, so that you can outperform the market. So a lot of what we try to do is build a product class that I'm sure we'll get into later in the show that allows us to basically get our unfair share. You know, look, if we get our fair share, fine, we're, we're doing good analysis on the markets. But if we have to, we can roll up our sleeves and we can we can compete and we can challenge competitors because of our model is, uh, is superior. That, that makes sense. One of the things that just high level that I think of in terms of, and I am lumping them all together when I say senior sure. living, um, is is that, you know, multifamily, I mean, you mentioned it commoditized. Um, you know, it's a, it's a nice, affordable place to live. Um, but, and it's real estate, you know, where senior living, I think of has two components really has the real estate component, the location, the actual amenities of, of the property. Um, but then there's, like you mentioned, it's very much a service business. There is 
very much an operations component to it that is very much different than multifamily. Multifamily, you could have, you know, a leasing agent or maybe you know two or three leasing agents, you know, depending on the size of the property, and then some maintenance uh, personnel. But it's it's very different. The operations is a much bigger component in your in your world. Yeah, no question. I mean, as a good rule of thumb. I mean, just depending upon what kind of ratios you run and how you run your organization, we'll, we'll have anywhere from, you know, 0.8 to one employee per bed, right? So if you have 100 beds, you have almost 100 employees. If you have 1,000 wow. beds, you have almost 1,000 employees. You know, maybe some people, I mean, even if you cut that number in half, still 500, you know, just think about how many, you know, apartment units you have to own to have 500 employees. That's so it's crazy. definitely a service business. Yeah, definitely a service business. It's definitely a human resource business. Um, more so than it is a real estate business. The real estate's very important, and it's an important part of the story. But you know, if we're assigning the 80-20 rule, you know, maybe maybe multifamily is you know 80% real estate, 20% you know the team, and you know people can argue about that all day long. Uh, but you know, assisted living is probably the inverse. It's probably 80% team, 20% you know real estate. You I mean, know, if you think matters, about that, 100 beds, 100 units, like in a multifamily property, 100 units. You could manage that with one leasing agent, one maintenance person, and you're saying 100 beds is 100 employees, you know, almost. I mean, that's, that's right. Yeah, because you got all the caregivers and that's nursing a oversight and all difference. those things. So it's much mm-hmm. more cost intensive. Um, so with that, I would imagine having an efficient and operations business is is critical to the success of any of your projects. Yeah, no question. I mean, it, again, it's it's eighty percent operations, twenty percent real estate. So a lot of those, a lot of what what happens there is your ability to to lead and hire and and um, you know, find the right people and and uh, you know cut through people that that uh, have the right heart and attitude for the job and and uh, train train those that do have the heart and attitude to do it to be uh, good assets for the team. So it's definitely a, a different experience. And I, I've actually managed a four hundred unit apartment complex. I kind of have that. That uh, was actually the last job I had before I started Say Joke. So definitely have been on that side of the uh, equation. Definitely respect and love multifamily. We do that um, either passively or we also develop multifamily as well. Um, but, you know, my primary business is, is focused on, you know, uh, hiring uh, great caregivers and building good teams and, and making sure we have good nursing oversight for our residents. So talk about, um, you know, a project in, in your space compared to multifamily. Are the returns to investors, you know, comparable or are the returns, you know, better in your world versus multifamily? Um, and where do yeah. you where do you find the, the investors? You know, are they sure. are they? Um, yeah. Talk about both of those things. Yeah. So, I mean, we're developers. And so um, I would say, you know, that whenever like, you know, if you're comparing us to someone buying an existing multifamily deal versus us developing a senior housing deal, you know, a lot of multifamily deals are kind of that 15 to 17 percent internal rate of return sort of pool. Um, a lot of our deals will kind of be in that. 20 to 25 pool. So there's definitely a, definitely a, a, a greater risk involved in development. Um, you know, we think we can de-risk it, but you know, generally the perception is development's a little riskier. You obviously have delayed on when you get returns. Um, and then also too, obviously the operational intensity of the business means that there should be a little bit more of a risk reward for investors. So yeah, you generally will see a little bit more, a little bit better returns. Um, you know, look, you can see great IRs and, and things that are, have no management, like self storage, for example, or sure. multifamily. Um, but but on average, I would say yes, they they run a little, little bit higher cap rate. Um, you know, so like a national average cap rate for assisted living might be seven and a half or eight percent, whereas with multifamily, it's probably close to five and a half it's in, cap right, or it's something. In the fives now, right? Yeah, right. whatever the number is, whether you know what market or A, B, or C. As far as finding investors. Um, there's a lot of elements. Um, I think one thing we've really tried to do on our end is we try to find investors that uh, that sort of resonate with the idea of sort of conscious capitalism, sort of impact investing. So you know, at the end of the day, if you're going to deploy a hundred thousand dollars, let's just say the returns are equal, and you know, in one version you're renting an apartment, you lease it to somebody, it's good, you feel pretty good about what you do. The other version, you might be literally changing someone's life because they've fallen ten or fifteen times in the prior facility. And they come to you with a broken hip and, and they're just like, you know, please help me stop mom from falling. Sure. You know, you have somebody with dementia that maybe is an elopement risk and has gotten out of another facility or they're having behaviors or they're having these other issues. 
or somebody with congestive heart failure that needs to keep their legs propped up and the other facility couldn't stay on top of that. And so they were constantly having problems, maybe more medication. So, you know, all the stories that we hear, um, you know, people really resonate with. So a lot of our investors, frankly, have personal experience. So physicians love this as an investment because they understand the uh, certain elements of it. Um, secondarily, um, a lot of our investors have had a grandparent, a mom, a dad in assisted living or memory care or skilled nursing. And so they've, they've really gone through that process. And so, you know, if they believe that like we do, that we've built, you know, a better mousetrap, so to speak, that our model of care is better, that our physical plan is better, that our philosophy is better, then it, it allows them to invest in, in, in something they feel good about. You know, I kind of always jokingly tell the story. I'll, I'll be brief, but no, go you know, for it. Darren, do you, do you like, do you like children? Absolutely. Okay, perfect. And who doesn't love kids? And, and what if I had an investment that uh, that would help you empower children? Would you be interested? Yeah. It has it has three hundred percent returns. How does that sound? That sounds fantastic. Awesome. It's arming child soldiers in Africa. How do you feel about it now? Yeah, it's a little different. So my point always was is that there are things that doesn't matter what the returns are. People would never invest in, right? Right. For some people, that line is tobacco. For some people, that's you know, oil for some people it's arming child soldiers but look there's obviously people that invest in arming child soldiers because someone does it so the point i'm trying to make is there, there's a line for investors and i wanted to kind of flip that on its head and say what if you could put your capital to work get better returns and also help people yeah um you know and, and so when, when you hear things like oh wow like a lot of employees on the one hand that's a lot of hassle for you know the, the person running the deal but for an investor, you can feel good because you've you've act, you've added jobs to a community, oftentimes right. a community that you live in. So there's all kinds of elements of conscious capitalism that kind of exist, which is basically where you not only are investing for dollars, but you're also investing to improve the community, to improve things. You know, anecdotally, when we go through like metropolitan planning commissions or zoning boards, we don't get a lot of pushback when we're installing you know clean, safe, affordable senior housing, but you could get pushback, you know, for apartments and other things. And we've had that experience on sort of side by side plats before. So the communities generally really want this stuff. And, and so people feel good about investing in these types of things. That's a big thing that we talk about. Um, you know, the answer how you get investments, we get in awesome relationships that people like yourself that that have have an audience and we tell our story. And if it resonates, it resonates. That's a big yeah. part of what we do. You know, look, I had no idea how you were going to answer that. And it and it it surprised me the answer, but it makes sense. You know, that there's, there's a component to it that's kind of emotional, um, that, sure. that if you, you know, you've had somebody in your life that has had to experience that and whether you've had a positive experience or a negative experience, um, it still may be something that you're very passionate about and, and wanting to give back to other people so that they either have just as good or better, a situation um or to avoid a poor situation if if you know you had a loved one in a in a poor situation so um that makes a lot of sense and then once somebody it's just like any other you know private placement deal i would imagine that once somebody has a positive experience um one they they have that positive impact and they can see the project going well and and helping people and then two that the returns are are attractive then they want to come back and do more and they want to tell their, you know, their family and friends and colleagues. And so I would imagine you get, you know, growth from, from, you know, positive experiences. Yeah, no question. I mean, like anything else, you know, I think, you know, the investment side is, is a separate business. You have to treat it as a separate business. You have to kind of, you know, you've got to, you've got to plant seeds, you got to water those seeds, you have to, you know, till the soil, all that. It's, you know, we really think about investing as, as, as a farming enterprise and, and not a hunting enterprise. Um, you know, I've probably done, you know, I don't know, 10 or 12 shows in the last couple of months. And we really don't have a raise coming up. We don't anticipate having a raise necessarily anytime soon. It's just because, you know, we just really enjoy getting into relationships with people and, and finding more about what they want to learn about. And look, I mean, there are people that don't want to invest in something that's going to take two or three years to develop. There are people that don't don't resonate with that story. Um, there are people that don't like the operational risk, but there are people that do like that stuff. Um, and, you know, a lot of times, especially in real estate, I think people sometimes lose track of kind of having a balanced, well thought out portfolio. You know, so for example, if someone's like really successful in one space, they just like pound that space over and over and over again. Right. But I would argue sometimes that's risky, right? So if you're successful in self storage, there's no harm in having, you know, 5% or 10% of your portfolio allocated to multifamily, 
you know, having five or 10% of your portfolio in say energy or something else. And then, you know, senior housing kind of represents one of those other alternative asset classes that I think, you know, has a compelling story. So a lot of it really is about just getting in conversation with people and realizing that like, look, if, if the stock market crashes or if jobs go down, it doesn't necessarily impact senior housing in the same way that it would affect apartments. Right. Um, you know, so it's a way for you to kind of have a non-correlated asset um, and, and provide some value for some people. So that's part of our story and kind of what we talk about. You know, personally, I love energy investment because it's pretty uncorrelated with what, you know, what we do. Right. Um, you know, people are going to need care for mom or dad if the price of oil is $50 a barrel or $75 a barrel. That makes <laughs> Absol- sense. Absolutely. Hey, so you talked about you guys do a lot of development um, and I'm not, I haven't been involved in any development deals, but ones that have been presented to me um, have been such that actually I, now I am involved in, I'm in one retail development deal now. Um, sure. But in any event, it's been presented to me that it's really the initial investment is getting from, you know, just ground to getting it developed. And then, then at that point, you know, you could end, end up, you know, getting out of the deal or sure. potentially continue on. Are your deals structured that way as well? Yeah. So great question. Uh, I'll probably answer, I'll, I'll explain a little bit about our structure and then answer it directly. Okay. Um, so we're pretty vertically integrated right now. Uh, and I hate using that term, but it's just something everyone understands. A lot of people so, use that term. We, I know. I'm actually going to walk you through how we are. So we, we find right. the land. Um, we raise capital to take down the land. Um, we, we, we build. We develop in-house. Uh, and then uh, when the construction is done, I operate. Um, so we really do do everything except for the vendors we hire, like architecture and civil. You know, So basically, one of our partners is a builder and developer. One of our partners is capital raising and operations. And so we do have a very good... Um, system and process. So what we've decided to do is you're right. Um, and as people kind of understand development, they realize there's lots of different ways you can um, sort of get off the bus, so to speak. So sometimes you find land, you sell the land, it's a transaction. Sometimes you get the land through certain entitlements or something approved with the city, and then you sell it. You can get the land shovel ready and sell it. You can build the product and sell it to the end operator. You can build the product, get it full and sell it to someone. So there's a lot of different ways to exit, but because of our sort of, you know, various skill sets along the way, um, our investors are generally in deals for seven to 10 years is kind of a typical timeline for us. Uh, and then secondarily, we've kind of designed uh, sort of two products and we think this is a great way to engage with different types of people. So we find a piece of land, we'll go get a land loan for it. And then we'll budget, you know, because land development is expensive. You could spend several hundred thousand dollars with, due diligence and with architects and concepts and civil engineers you know, before you ever even meet with the city. So what we'll do is we'll offer a product that looks a lot like, you know, 18 month, two year hard, hard money for land, right? So maybe we'll give investors a 12% or a 15% return. And they basically get two things. They get that return at the end when we sell to, to the next phase. So we're basically our own customer, but they also secure the first right of refusal in the next phase. So for people that know that our deals sometimes at that, you know, uh, lease up construction phase, sometimes fill up pretty quickly. Um, As an example, on our last project, we had $1.5 million for a a land deal that we did. And that 1.5 pledged a little over 2 million for the next phase. So we had almost a 33% increase over, um, over that initial phase. So what that allows us to do and I'm sure your gears are kind of turning. It kind of gives us two different products. So we can have people that inter- interact with us. There's like, look, I want to be involved with you guys for 18 months, two years, make my percent and straight coupon. I'm out of the deal. And some people do do that. And then other people are like, I want to stay in the whole way. And so it does a couple of things. It gives investors different products to think about, but it also allows us to kind of reset the internal rate of return clock because it's two separate transactions. Right. And so sometimes it might take three or four years in certain cities to actually find a piece of land and start building anything on it. Well, if we break that four years up, pay the investors into two years and start that clock again, it really doesn't put as much downward pressure on the internal rate of return um, because obviously internal rate of return, your, your enemy is the clock, right? right? Money today is worth more than money in the future. And so obviously if you can break it up. So it allows us to really have a couple different products and then also solve some investor concerns. And it also de-risks things because some investors can say, hey, get it to reduce municipal risk, get it to where the land is shovel ready. And then I want to invest, right? Because your, their fear is not the operations or not the demographics. Their fear is 
a government saying, hey, we don't want this or, you know, kind of nitpicking your sidewalk width, for example. Right, right. right. So that's kind of our that's kind of our way of doing things. We found it's worked really well and, and, our, and our investors seem to resonate with that sort of two phase uh, procedure. No, oh, that's great because, like you said, I mean, you have different investors that have different needs, different wants, different fears, um, and to be able to uh, satisfy, you know, the needs of multiple different types of investors is is key, and let to let yeah. them either stay in, you know, all the way through, or get off the bus, like you said, you know, at different stages. That's that's attractive as well. Um, For sure. So. My recollection, and maybe it's things have changed, but my recollection is that your your projects were a little different than what I would I I would kind of envision. Like I I'm driving on you know one of the freeways in Dallas, and I go by you know a, a senior living facility, and it looks kind of like a apartment complex, or it looks kind of like a hotel, um, and I know it's you know it says senior living, so I know that they have a lot you know, a lot of other amenities in there and, and staff and whatnot. But my understanding was at least at some point you guys were like buying up single family homes and then renovating them and, and making it uh, more homey for, you know, these people to, to be involved in rather than being a big, you know, kind of hospital like facility. Yep. No, that's uh, you got the recollection. Correct. Um, and, that's actually a great starting point to answer the question. Um, so good question. Um, so single family homes, sometimes referred to as residential assisted living, residential care homes. It's kind of its own little niche in the space. It's how I cut my teeth, it's how I got in the business. It's the model of care that I think is superior for a lot of things. I think your food, your care, your communication will be better in, in those environments. And that's actually our company slogan, great care, great food, great communication. Um, however, there are some challenges with that model. Um, and so what I, what I kind of do is just kind of related to my personal story. When I had one care home with eight residents, I worked really hard. When I had two care homes, 16 residents, I worked twice as hard. <laughs> when I had five care homes, I didn't really have to work as much. And so there's scaling problems with that business. And so a lot of times, you know, the one or, so what happens with a lot of investors or a lot of entrepreneurs is you have this, um, you have this sort of class of entrepreneurs that want to be hands off. They really want to be investors. And, you know, when you're starting an operationally intensive business, it's got to be big enough for you to hire everybody you need. Otherwise, you're gonna have to do some of those things. So I was the manager, I was, you know, touring the facility, you know, obviously, I had help, but, um, but I was having to do a lot of things that that, you, that when you go buy a 100 unit apartment complex, you wouldn't necessarily have to do. So we'll just kind of pause that for a second to relate that to your audience. It's the difference between buying a 200 unit apartment complex that has all the scale versus buying a 20 unit apartment apartment complex where you don't necessarily have that scale. Right. And you might you'd be paying someone like, oh, I'll give you half off your rent and you'd be the property manager type arrangements. Well, imagine though that on that 20 unit building, you couldn't find a property manager. You had to self-manage. That's really the way it works in RAL. There really isn't um, a viable, not yet, maybe there will be. We've, we've talked about it with some people and some thought leaders in the space. There's not really a viable model for third-party management of an eight or 10 bed facility because it's just hard to scale. Right. Now go all the way back to the other end of the spectrum, that big senior living facility that you were describing, it has flaws. It has technical and structural flaws in it. Um, generally, they have lower ratios. So in a residential care home, you might have a one to four, one to five, one to six, you know, caregiver to resident ratio. But in a big building, you might have a dedicated person that goes around doing activities all day. It's unlikely you can afford that in a eight bed facility. Right. In a big building, you'll have transportation. Unlikely you'll be able to afford to have a van and a driver for a 10 bed facility. And so you can just kind of imagine there's all these things that a big building has, gyms and chandeliers and underwater treadmills and all kinds of stuff. And then you have these little care homes that are just cooking good meals, taking good care of people. You feel like you're at home and, and, and it's all positive. And so the latest evolution of our company and what we're gonna be doing basically for the rest of our lives is a permutation of the two. So we took all the advantages of residential assisted living and all the scaling advantages of a big building, and we decided to build a product that is a campus of care homes. So a typical project for us, we call it a planned care home community. So a typical project for us, you pull up, it looks like a neighborhood. Instead of 3,000 square foot houses, there are 9,000 square foot houses. And instead of having a family inside, they have 16 beds for assisted living and memory care inside, all on one campus. 
You'll have a central sales and leasing office, so you have all the advantages and benefits that you would have with a big building, transportation, you know, a park setting to, to, to wander in and get some vitamin D, especially important for our, our seniors. But you, have, but you also have the love and care of being in a small setting. And you could be in house one and you could never see anybody in house five if you didn't want to. Um, so it, we're basically just taking that building instead of you know building three, four, five stories. We, they're all single stories. So we're basically doing horizontal development. I don't have a single set of stairs or elevators in any of our, in our, our communities. We do in the office, but in terms of where the residents reside, it's all single story, no elevators, no confusion. It's absolutely a home-like setting, but we have all the adva advantages of a big building. And the primary advantage we have is we have access to financing that's more conducive for commercial. Um, one of the biggest challenges you'll run into in residential assisted living is when you go to find a new property, how are they going to appraise it? Are they appraising it as a single family home? Or are they going to try to pretend that something you've never done before is going to be appraised as a vibrant business? Refinancing is a little bit easier if you have a vibrant income stream you can prove over two or three years. When you're first starting, residential assisted living can be very equity intensive because it's hard to find debt. And so like right now, my Dallas portfolio, which we're refinancing, we might be at 40% leverage. Oh, wow. It's not because you wanted to be at 40% leverage, it's because we had no other choice other than to raise a lot of equity. And obviously, wow. as you know, when, you're, when your leverage is low, it means that your returns for investors will be depressed a little bit because you don't have the ability to lever debt. And so obviously you're more equity intensive. So that cash flow is sort of you know, sort of feeding the sort of feeding the beast that that the investors um, and return thresholds are, and so with these other communities we can go in and get very traditional 70, 75 percent, you know, 80 percent financing, and it really does flip the whole thing on its head. And then of course now the real key to the whole thing is you've got your whole team, you've got an executive director, you've got an assistant executive director, you have nursing oversight, you have activities, you've got a sales and leasing person, marketing, all on this one campus. But we still have all the advantages, right? It's still an open kitchen. There's still no long hallways. We still cut down on falls. It still feels like home. So if you've got dementia, you're not confused because you spent 50 years in a house and now all of a sudden you're in this big, you know, glass apartment building. Right. So we really have kind of taken the best of both worlds and, and, and kind of put them together. So and what so, does a campus um, look like in terms of size? So you talked about 9,000 yeah. square feet um, and I think you said eight beds in that. Um, uh, 16 on that. 16, in, 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 oh, our, 16 in our new beds, development, okay. we do 16. Our Dallas operation has eight beds per house. So how many buildings, how many units in one campus It would be kind of typical? Sure. Great question. So we'll usually look for a minimum of six acres. Um, you know, we have a site as big as 20 acres right now that we'll plan on selling off part of the parcel to possibly a synergistic partner. Our, our project in Denton, actually, you'll have to come uh, come visit it sometime. Yeah, but our project cool. in Denton, uh, we're putting in roads right now, and we also have a chunk of the land for sale because we, we bought 20 acres. We didn't need it all. I we'll think probably I develop, remember when you were raising for that a, w a while back. Yeah. So, yeah. We'll I'd probably love to develop see that. about 10 acres of that for assisted living and memory care. We found that our magic number is when we first do our first phase, we like to start off with about 80 beds as a minimum. So that would be five, 16 bed houses. Our project in Denton has 96 beds to start. Every time we do a project, it's, it's that number of buildings plus one because we have a independent sales and leasing office where the admin team is, is contained. Um, so, you know, we'll build, build anywhere from five to six to 10 acres. Um, and we wanna try to create a nice park setting you know, so if somebody wants to go, go on a walk or go on a visit, we've got nice walkways and, 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 and landscaping so they can get outside and, and be outdoors. Um, one thing that I want to just make sure that everyone understands because of when this is being recorded, look, I don't know when it'll be released, but as of right now, we're, we're in the middle of COVID, right? We've got, you've got a, a big pandemic and that it affects uh, the elderly, especially, and especially the elderly that have comorbidities, i.e. people in assisted living and skilled nursing. Um, we don't have a single case of COVID in our Dallas operation, not one. Awesome. And, and, you know, look, our team has done a great job, but, you know, one of the secret sauces is our model is superior to infection control. If you think about that big, glimmering, shining building that you drove past uh, and you referenced when you're driving down the highway in DFW, how many hundreds of people come through that front door every day? And so when you got something that, you know, like the flu or norovirus, or in this case, COVID, um, you know, it can get into a building pretty easily. And then once it's in there, it's very difficult. You know, you got somebody that wanders, it's very difficult to isolate. And so you've got a, you've got an outbreak on your hands and that's, that's what we've seen all over America. When the counting's all said and done, I think about 30 or 35% of all deaths in the United States from COVID will be directly related to long-term care facilities. So it's a big, big problem, long-term care. 
First rule of thumb is keep it out of the front door. What's the best way to keep it out of the front door? Segregate your residents into smaller population clusters so that the visitation numbers go down. So now you've got 10 people to watch, 12 people to watch coming to the front door, not 100. And so right. those 16 residents have, say, 10x a reduction, a 10x reduction in exposure. And then, God forbid, you have an outbreak. It's contained in one building. In one building. Because you don't have to have any kind of intermingling between the two houses or the three houses or the five houses. They're all separately licensed, self-contained. So in the pandemic, especially, these small settings have performed very, very well. And of course, um, I think of COVID as an accelerant. Whatever trend we were having in the the system, whether it be economic or, or whatever, COVID seemed to accelerate that trend. And so I think this push to become smaller and more boutique and more intimate was already happening in the business. And now COVID's like, oh, by the way, in addition to the better care, better food, better communication, you know, you may have like a, a, f a fraction of a chance of, con of contracting a virus as you do in a big setting. Um, sometimes we're talking about 20x, 10x differences in, in rates of infection. Um, you know, I couldn't give you a number because right now we're at zero and at, at present I can't multiply zero times anything. Right. No, that, that's um, huge to, to have that experience. Um, and what you say makes a lot of sense in terms of having the separate buildings and being able to control it. And if there is an outbreak in one. Um, now, I, I imagine that there you have staff that bounce from, you know, one building to another building. And so, you know, if that person was to get you know, contract it, they could potentially sure. uh, bring it to other buildings. But um, it sounds like you it's it's very high on your guys list to control um, who's coming in, who's going out and, and monitor that. So that's no that's question. Huge. So far, all so far, about 70 percent of our closed calls have been visitors and about 30 percent have been staff. So you're absolutely right. Um, you know, look, the best thing you can do to help long term care facilities is get the virus under control outside, because right. at the end of the day, none of us are self sufficient, right? We have food come in, we have hospice, we have family visit. In fact, when, when visitation was banned, um, we saw a lot of a lot of premature death from just people being very lonely and not, you know, having dementia, not understanding why their daughter or their son or their loved one couldn't come visit them. So there's no easy answers here. And our model wasn't perfect. I could get a phone call today that, that we have our first case in Dallas right, and, right. And, 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 you know, look, it wouldn't, it wouldn't surprise me. Maybe, maybe the answer that we have is that we're, it's not our turn yet right. and we'll have our, have our, have our turn. I hope that never happens. But what I will say is uh, from a mathematical point of view, the less number of people you have come to the front door, the more, the, the, the more better off you are, right. you know, the better you have, the better you design your facility for sight lines. You know, it's not all that hard to, you know, go into an assisted living facility. And if you're like, maybe you're not all that concerned about it. You're like, I'm going to take my mask off and give my mom a hug and a kiss that they may not see you. But in our facility, it's a little harder to get away with that stuff. And so we can sort of police visitation better. Obviously, with our campuses designing great outdoor spaces, it's easier. You look elevators. Th those are a place where you can't really socially distance and you got to touch a lot of things. So there's just a lot of different things that all sort of add up. So our zero cases is, is a combination of half a dozen things kind of all coming together. But I'm firmly convinced that the model itself, and this is based on talking to other operators in the space, the model of itself is just far superior for infection control. And I think infection control is going to be on everyone's top of the mind awareness for, for a long time. And Absolutely. so that's kind of a secret sauce and, and something I think is going to really propel our business is that, you know, look, all things being equal, you got to a 10 X less of a chance of contracting something deadly. And that's pretty powerful. Yeah. The other thing, and, and I'm not, you know, I'm 50, so I have, a, I think I have a long way to go before we get there, but, um, you know, what you guys are providing is, is different. It's a different slant. It's, it's choice, you know, so you end up having, you know, people that need this type of care one way or another, right? And if everybody just built the big facility and people didn't have a choice, but then there's certain people that, you know, they just don't want it to go into one. Like they want something that's more homey, sure. more friendly. And so you're providing an alternative. And like you said, great care, great food, great communication. I mean, the, obviously care is extremely important. Food can be neglected at times, you know, um, but, People like to have good food, man. Sure. Um, so, so that's it's important that that's one of your, your components. 
No, I mean, you nailed it. And we actually think the secret for our company really is communication, the, the sort of the third one, because anybody that's ever interacted with American healthcare has dozens of, I really wish they would have communicated with me better stories, right? But and you're talking about um, the family, communication both. to the family yeah. or communication to the, to the actual communicating to families, time. any number of things. Okay. Just a very, we take a very, we take communication very seriously, so seriously that it's in our slogan. It's, it's a commitment that we make to families. But, but to your point, to kind of relate it back to something the audience understands, um, I, you know, we both invest in apartments. I don't think you hate single family homes, right? right? You don't hate them. I don't hate big buildings, but right. I think that apartments and single family homes offer choice to the client. There are some clients that, you know, a single family home rental makes a ton of sense for, and there are some right. clients that an apartment rental makes a ton of sense for, and it's really just a battle of market share. There's a certain number of renters. What's their preference? Yeah. Same thing in this, it's you know, all, there are people totally that, sense. Yeah, there are people that want to go into the big shining, you know, they want to work out every day. They want to hang out with 20 people in a, in a, in a little private movie theater. They want to jump on a bus and, and go gamble or they want to jump on a bus and go to Luby's or Piccadilly or whatever they want to do. And that's that's the lifestyle they want to have. They want big activities. And there are other people. We talk about it all the time in everyday life. You know, are you an introvert or an extrovert? Well, that's a fundamental question for seniors, too. You know, if you've been an introvert your entire life, who in the heck wants to go live with 200 other people? You know, you got to go to restaurant style dining with 50, 60 other people. Right. If you happen to be losing your memory and maybe you're at that early stage where you're aware of it, you're embarrassed, you don't know the people, you're shy. And so what do you do? You self-isolate. You spend all day, every day in your room, and you see a lot of that in a big building. But when you go to a care home or a residential assisted living facility like what we're talking about, a lot of people are in the common area. Because it's bite size, it's more like Thanksgiving every day than it is, you know, a forty or fifty person dinner in a restaurant style dining setting or, or these activities that that have so many people. So it's just less intimidating for certain people. You know, the other thing that kind of kind of comes into play is, you know, what's your mobility like? You know, the, the harder it is for you to go down the hallway, the shorter you want that hallway to be. Right. Um, you know, so if you've got to go a hundred yards down a hall, take a left, go fifty more yards to get to get to dinner, maybe go down an elevator. That's a chore. Um, but if you're just 50 feet away, like in a traditional single family home, it's it's less of a chore. And so um, we fundamentally see changes in behavior when you change environments. Western medicine, unfortunately, you know, doctors probably will learn a whole lot more if they just went to your house because they'd see how you were living. They would see what the challenges are that you'd have that you come to the office. They don't talk about your diet. They don't know what the physical layout of your house is. And it's like, look, if you have mobility problems and you got 100 stairs at your house, probably a problem. And so for us, it's all about just create, like you said, creating choice and giving different options. You know, we think it's a better way for a lot of people, but it's not for everybody. Just like right. a big building is not for everybody. Just like an apartment is not for everybody. Just like a single family rental is not for everybody. So Lo, let me ask you this. Like it's obvious through this discussion that you have a lot of passion for what you do. Um, and you also mentioned that you did apartments you had a 400 unit apartment complex that you managed before getting into this. Well, you know, why, why did you make the switch? Well, actually I know the exact day that I decided. So um, tell me why. <clears throat> well, I mean, so there's, there's two things at that. There's one story that's humorous, which is why I left the apartment business. But, but the other thing really was uh, just like some of the investors, you know, personal, uh, my, my dad got sick in 20, 2013. Um, I was, quit my job and was going to do some traveling and his health deteriorated and we stopped our trip and came home early and uh, you know he ultimately passed away and he was on hospice and he had a, a terrible experience and I spent the better part of the year which was the statute of limitations in Louisiana trying to figure out if I wanted to sue the hospice company and around the time that this was kind of coming to a close you know I discovered the residential assisted living model now during that year I was working at the apartment complex and so I discovered the residential assisted living model. So it wasn't linear. I got into the business because I was, my heart was open and I was exposed to these concepts. Right. You know, I got into the business for capitalist reasons, but then I started realizing like, okay, these are kind of like my grandmother's and it was kind of like, this is not a way for me to honor my dad. And that all kind of happened. But the, the moment that I got out of the apartment business was actually pretty funny. I worked at a, I worked at a, a property that was probably like 30% section eight and it was, it was a good property. Um, I'm not like a, I'm like a huge kid. I'm like a huge kid guy. I actually love the elderly way more than I like kids. And we had a lot of kids at our property and as summer was approaching the way that property worked is during like business hours during school, it, it ran great. And then when that bus pulled up and the kids got off, it was, it was Man. a free for all. And, and, <laughs> and I was the manager, the assistant manager for most of the time. So I was running around and I took my job seriously. And I remember 
I was walking the grounds and I knew summer was coming and I saw these kids and they had broken up this, like we had, I guess, this random concrete thing that might have been a barbecue pit or something in the past and they'd smashed the concrete up and they were smashing the air conditioners of this apartment complex in oh, Fort Worth no. with concrete. They're literally destroying where they live. And, you know, they're just being kids. I get right. it. I did right. dumb things when I was a kid too, but right. I'm like, you know, I don't have any kids and I don't want to have a hundred kids that I got to deal with over the summer. And so I'm like, there's no way I can survive a summer. They were, the company was putting the property up for sale. Um, and so I was like, yeah, I knew it was kind of be a short time deal. And, and like, they did a good job. They offered bonuses to employees to stay through the process of the sale. I was a little unique. I was doing it for the education. So the money really wasn't important to me. I just was dreading going through a summer and I said, I'm just not doing this. And, and then then the senior housing thing kind of happened simultaneously. It was all just kind of lining up. I'm, I'm very lucky. I, I kind of stumbled onto my calling, if that makes any sense. So yeah. very fortunate you know situation. Sometimes it's lucky. Sometimes the big man upstairs kind of points you in a direction. Sometimes, you know, you have to be open to opportunities sure. and then take action, you know, when they come, come yeah, by yeah. because – um, look, everybody gets opportunities, but not everybody takes action on them. So I applaud you. Yeah, for absolutely. My father, uh, there's no chance I, I would be in this business. I just think it's zero percent chance. Um, but I, you know, when people say that God works in mysterious ways, it's not how I believe, but I do think it's kind of amusing to think about like God works in mysterious ways. And in my case, it was kids smashing an air conditioner with concrete. So yeah. that was what, that was yeah. my religious awakening, apparently. So. Yeah. So so I do believe in stuff like that. But um, sure. In, in any event, um, let's go back, man. So how'd you grow up? You know, where'd you grow up? Did you, your brothers, sisters, rich, poor? Well, Tell me. this is quick for me because I, I'm I'm only child. Only child. Uh, okay. And uh, where'd you grow I up? Grew up Grew up in Shreveport, Louisiana. Okay, um, it's a lovely place. Um, you go for the gambling, you stay because you got shot. <laughs> so uh, that's uh, that's where I grew up. Uh, look, I, you know, Shreveport was a great place to grow up for me because um, I went to a great school and I got a lot of great opportunity. And what was that great school? Uh, Caddo 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 Magnet. Uh, they had a great magnet school that fed okay. in from the whole parish, which is like our counties. And uh, it was a great school and I learned a lot and there's a lot of opportunity, but I just knew Louisiana wasn't for me. So as soon as I graduated, I didn't even take the ACT. You know, Louisiana kind of runs on the ACT system. Most other colleges run on the SAT. I took the SAT, got fortunate and got a scholarship to the University of Texas, which I quickly punted away after a year uh, of, uh, of uh, you know, I did a good job inside the thing I got a scholarship for, but the educational component was lost on me a little bit. and. And uh, so I, I, I took a summer off, thought I was going back to college, saw an ad in the paper for selling cars, thought that'd be a fun summer job. And 12 years later and a bunch of promotions, uh, you know, I was running a car dealership and actually one of my business partners is, is, is a car dealer to this day. And uh, he's, he, when I sort of left, I said, hey, I'm going to start a company. Would you be interested in helping, helping finance that and be a partner? And he's like, absolutely. You've done great for me. And so that's kind of my version of Silicon Valley. You know, it's one of the few industries where you leave a company and they might bankroll your new endeavor. It doesn't happen a lot in the car business, but in my case it did. So, you know, I was able to learn a lot at the car dealership about sales and marketing and risk and lending and, and all that stuff, but it just didn't touch the heart. And so I said, let me get into real estate. And I've been doing real estate since 07. So I had about seven, eight years where I was at the car dealership. And then I would, you know, at night I was the leasing manager and my, my business partner kind of managed the, um, the, the maintenance and repair side of the business. Um, so yeah, I've been in real estate for a while. I just sort of made the leap to being full time and into something entrepreneurial back in that 2013, 2014 window. So I'm not letting you off the hook yet on, on growing up. So you're, you're back, you know, in Louisiana, you're an only child, mom and dad, are they, are they entrepreneurs? Not really. I mean, my mother was a pharmacist. Um, my dad, um, was an accountant. Um, he did buy one rental house. Um, so I, I got that. He had bought one rent. He was like, had the one rental house. Um, so I did kind of get that experience. Um, you know, they were very supportive of me. Um, you know, they, my parents were always the classic. We don't care what you do. Just try to be happy. Right. Parents. They, I think they did that part. Right. Sadly, what was they your were both mindset in, growing up. I mean, did you think that you were going to be a business owner at some point or did, were you just kind of going through the system? I, Probably as a kid thought I was gonna do something in like comedy or acting or something, you know, or, and, and then then I thought I was gonna be a lawyer for a long time. So I got into debate and I was kind of the 
perfect combination of acting and comedy and 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 public speaking. Um, but I don't know. Like I just I think I would have been a good lawyer. I think I would have enjoyed being a lawyer. But there was also a lot of supply and demand problems with being a lawyer. There's a lot of people in law school, and it seemed like anybody that didn't know what they wanted to do became a lawyer. Um, and I, I don't really like research that much. So I would have been like the trial lawyer, or litigator, I think probably is what would have happened or I would have done something in sort of the negotiation side of the business. Right. Um, so that's what I thought I was going to do. So I went to university of Texas. I was getting my degree in history because history was the highest acceptance rate in law school. And then, uh, took that semester off and all my friends were like, you're leaving college to sell cars in Louisiana. I'm like, that's the plan. <laughs> that's the plan. So, Talk to the listeners about some time that you had fear. Like it, it may have been when you you left to to go start up. You know, you may have said, "Am I making a smart decision, a bad decision?" Or or when you left the car business and you're going to start up your own company. But most people that I've talked to, you know, at some point they run into fear, and they have to kind of find a way to push through it. Yeah. So at the car dealership, I sort of told myself this for a long time that I was always a number two, that that I saw myself as a number two. I didn't think I was capable of being a number one. Um, and I think the reason is, is that I've had this experience where I can let myself down, but I can't let other people down. If that makes any sense. Yeah. I mean, sometimes so, we're our, our toughest critic, right? Yeah. Or just, you know, I can lie to myself, but I'm not going to lie to my best friend. I'm not going to lie to my business partner. I'm not going to lie to an investor. Right. So I didn't really understand the time that I could create structures and systems where I could be the number one, but I was accountable to other people, accountable to employees, accountable to other people. And that was just kind of the maturation process. You know, when I left the dealership, I wasn't afraid mostly because look, I mean, if you can sell, I mean, yeah, maybe I go somewhere else and, you know, I, I start on a worse situation. I left on good terms. You know, I think I probably could still go back to the dealership if I wanted to just with based on relationships or whatever. So I kind of always thought it would be there. Um, what I, what I, the time that I was the most scared is when I first started becoming a developer, you know, I've only in the last like two months even allowed myself to call myself a developer. Like I might've said I was a developer in conversation, but I didn't really believe it. I was just like, I'm developing, <laughs> right, you know, right. So, um, but, but now, you know, with, with our buildings kind of at a stage now where like, it starts to hit me that things are going to exist after I'm gone and, and that, you know, this was a field and now it's something and people are going to go through end of life and have joy and celebration here. You know, that, that process is very good. But the, the part that I had fear is there's a lot that you can't control in development. And, you know, when someone like me, who's like, you know, you paid me to get the job done, whatever it takes type of guy, um, that can be really tough on you. And, you know, when you feel out of control and, you know, Lake Charles, unfortunately, you know, so I've been developing in uh, a pandemic in two markets, two different states. So you have all that stuff and the supply chain stuff, and that's very scary. But then you also have, you know, Lake Charles got hit by two hurricanes. It's the only metro area in the history of the United States to get hit in t by two hurricanes in the same season. That's crazy. Well, we've got a very, yeah, just, just total statistical anomaly. And, you know, that's scary. And you know, when you're like getting force majeure claims, so I'd sort of joke and say that I'm probably like the most force majeure claims for two developments in history. Like, I feel like that's me because I've got, I think I'm up to like five force majeure claims. Like people can go their entire career without a force majeure claim. And I have five on two projects. So explain what that is to, to listeners. What is that? The, the short version, look, I'm from Louisiana public school, so I don't know that I should be trying to, I mean, I know a little French, but basically force majeure is something happens beyond the control of the contractor, subcontractor, or the counterparty to your contract, so much so that they can't honor the contract any longer. It doesn't mean they get to back out. It just means they can reprice the contract. It sometimes means they could back out. So in the case of a hurricane, that's clearly a, a major natural disaster. The size of the first hurricane that hit Lake Charles was, was nothing short of devastating. And just imagine you're a roofing subcontractor and now every roof in town needs to be repaired. Plus you've got supply chain issues. And so, you know, a lot of subcontractors are like, look, I need to get out of the contract and you can just sue me or do whatever you got to do because I'm printing money over here by going to do these other things. Uh, to their credit, uh, we, have an, we had an amazing uh, general contractor uh, in Lake Charles that's just done a phenomenal job. Um, they have been with us every step of the way and they could have walked away easily. Obviously, my business partner in Denton is a is a is a, uh, is, a is the general contractor. So I really really hope that he doesn't abandon the job at any point no, in time. We get in trouble. Absolutely not. But 
their subcontractors are like, look, we've got to increase material prices. We've got to do this. We've got to do that. So essentially, the subcontractors told people well, we can't honor these contracts. I don't know if you recall uh, during COVID, lumber prices are still high and went yeah, crazy shot because up the mills were shut down really quickly. So you know, you sign a you sign a uh, an estimate, you know, for lumber at four hundred thousand, and then next thing you know, the lumber's seven hundred thousand or, or eight hundred thousand. And so they can't eat that and stay in business. And so that's what force majeure is, is basically these events beyond their control. And obviously COVID is, is a source of major force majeure claims as was a hurricane. And, and then I, I had two hurricanes and a pandemic uh, in Lake Charles. So that's, that's scary. That, that kept me awake at night. Uh, and you know, ultimately um, the way I sort of reframe all that now, cause I'm not dead yet, is it took a lot of grit. And I kind of told my bankers a joke. I'm like, look, man, if we bring this project the way I think we're going to bring it and, and you get all your money like you're supposed to, you should loan me anything I ever want ever again. This I, get a, I get a lifetime pass, my man. Lifetime unlimited credit uh, with this bank. So, you know, that's awesome. just, and that's how I think about it because ultimately um, there's been a lot of projects that have been stalled out as a result of COVID or as a result of, you know, natural disasters. And we've dealt with both. Yeah, um, and we had some self. You know, we shot ourselves in the foot a couple times too. So you know, you take all that together. Um, I am definitely a changed man. Um, so, Lo, I've what's been, the the next big stretch goal for you, man? You know, it's kind of funny. Um, I, I almost had to stop doing that uh, with development because development is, is so. I mean, you have you have you commit, and it's like years and years into this process. What I'd really like to do is, as long as this is fun, um, and it has to keep being fun. I'd like to be building, you know, one of these, you know, 80, 90 bed, 100 bed facilities, these campuses, you know, I basically like to start one, one a year so that we're always in the process of developing one stuff is coming online, very much focused on kind of keeping a tight geographical timeline so that we can basically just, you know, focus on being a great medium sized regional player in the business. Um, that's kind of what I like to do as long as it stays fun. I mean, at the end of the day, if I build these couple of projects, um, I've certainly found for sure that when I make more money, it doesn't make me happier. I know everyone reads that stuff. We all think that it does. But the truth is, having made more money, it doesn't actually make me happier. Um, I do have a sense of like anxiety reduction when I have a little bit of money in the bank. Clearly, I'm not worried about that. But, you know, to me, the difference between making a million dollars or $500,000 or $2 million, it doesn't really matter to me. Um, I truly, truly enjoy the process of what we're doing. I enjoy helping people. I love the idea of taking a piece of dirt and turning it into something that, you know, something that it maybe wouldn't exist if I didn't do it. Absolutely. And um, that, that's what speaks to me at this point. That's kind of, I'm not creative. I'm not an artist. I can't sing. I can't dance. Uh, all I can really do is talk and, and, and uh, figure out a way to. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure lead. you could do more than that, but hey, so I can talk and I can. I can lead a team to help build stuff, there, you know, you so that's basically, well, you, and, and you have a vision and you're able to execute sure. on that vision. But so what, what do you like to do outside of work? Yeah, I really have just have a couple hobbies. Um, I play poker, um, what probably people would consider to be relatively high stakes poker. Uh, and then I, I shoot a lot. Um, so, uh, mostly long range. So I shoot it like, a thousand to fifteen hundred yards. I'm kind of working my awesome. way to a mile. I think probably within a couple months we'll we'll be out to a mile. Um, it's an expensive hobby. Ammo is high right now, and you, you got so I've I've spent a lot of money on guns and ammo in <laughs> right. the last couple of years. Basically, I play poker to fund my uh, my my gun and ammo uh, habit. Nice. So my two hobbies are yes. Yeah, so I'm just like I don't know. I'm like this half city boy, Texan country boy. It's very it's a very weird permutation. So, um, you know, I'm like drinking fine wine, playing poker, and then going out in the, in the, in the uh, elements and, and, and shooting, shooting at a thousand yards. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, uh, if people want to get a hold of you, what's the best way to, for them to reach out? Absolutely. Yeah. So um, if they want to learn, so what I've done, since you were kind of have to invite me to be on the show, uh, we, I've got a book they can have a copy of for free oh, awesome. on our website. It's, um, our website's Good Horn Capital. So good, G-O-O-D, horn, like Horn and Hornbuckle, goodhorncapital.com. Um, and this is capital with an A, not like the place that you attack on January 6th. Just kidding. Uh, and so goodhorncapital.com, and uh, there'll be a free book for them. Um, they just put in their name and email address. We'll send them a copy. It's called The Say Joke Story. Say Joke is our operations company and, and sort of our brand that forward faces consumers 
and it'll, it'll tell them, you know, it'll tell my dad's story and it'll tell how we kind of got in the business, you know, how we kind of have a different philosophy. So I think it's a great thing for investors or potential vendors to read just because it, it's really me kind of giving them my insight on the business. And, and so I think our investors like to check that out. And if they resonate with how I think, then, then perhaps we can, we can look to get into a relationship down the road. As I said before, we're not really raising right now, but you know, that could change any time. Um, but you know, we just give them a free book and if the book makes sense to them, they're happy to email or call us. That that's awesome. So anybody that goes to that website, can get the free book or do they have to put in some kind of code or anything? All I got to do is put in their name and email address and they awesome. got a good orange capital, put in the name and email address and uh, we'll, uh, we'll give them a free, uh, a free electronic version of the book. Fantastic. Lo, I really appreciate you coming on the show. Uh, listeners, I hope you enjoyed that one. I know I learned a ton. Um, until next week, signing off. Thanks for having me. Thank you for watching Darren Batchelder's Real Estate Investing Show. If you liked the episode, please click the like button and subscribe to the show. If you already are subscribed, then thank you. And please share the show with a friend. Check out other free resources at darrenbatchelder.com slash learn. 